Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Pradeep Ramalu. I'm an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute, and I'll be uh, lecturing on the behalf of MedTred and Dr. Ayala regarding secondary angle closure glaucomas. The date today is November 6, 2014. I think there's some truths about all secondary glaucomas that I think are that cut across each of the individual diseases that we'll talk about today. The first is that all of them are high pressure glaucomas. And indeed, we don't necessarily wait until there's actually glaucoma in the setting of optic nerve damage and visual field loss with these conditions. Rather, the onset of high pressure as a result of the mechanisms that we'll discuss today often um, um, produce the diagnosis of glaucoma, whether or not there's actually been vision loss related to the optic nerve damage from this high pressure. All of them result from impaired outflow of the aqueous humor, as though, although as we'll see, you need to think through how does aqueous humor normally flow out of the eye, and at what point is this outflow impaired. And when one thinks about this, you can really think about how the secondary glaucoma is producing its elevation of intraocular pressure, and either the potential for or frank glaucoma. Uh, if you look at the normal, uh, if you look at the normal um, angle, um, it, the fluid is formed by the ciliary body behind the lens, and uh, once you go from behind the lens, um, uh, it passes through a very narrow channel. Um, between the lens and the iris and comes into the anterior chamber. Uh, when it comes into the anterior chamber, it has a cross through the trabecular meshwork and it exits through the episcleral veins. Uh, so there's many places at which this can be blocked and we'll go through each of those individually in the next slide. So uh, first of all, it can happen in the context of an open angle, meaning that there's nothing physically blocking access to the trabecular meshwork and we won't talk about that today or it can happen in the, in, the, in the setting of a closed angle where um, the iris has now come up against the trabecular meshwork uh, and this can either be because the iris is being pulled forwards usually from some sort of fibrotic response that, uh, that causes it to fibrose uh, and zip shut with the trabecular meshwork or because there's something posteriorly pushing it closed. For example, in primary open angle closure glaucoma it's simply the aqueous in the posterior chamber which uh, pushes the iris forwards because of a high resistance at the iris lens channel. But you really need to think about where the normal pathway for aqueous is blocked with all of these secondary glaucomas. Uh, when you think about an open angle, which we won't talk about today, uh, the general areas where you can have outflow obstruction are either just prior to the meshwork, for example, if you have a high FEMA, within the meshwork itself, either as a result of changes in the connective tissue uh, from steroids or from trauma, or uh, distal to the trabecular meshwork in Schlumps Canal, for example, with elevated episcleral venous pressure seen in Sturge Weber. With closed angle glaucoma, uh, there's um, probably four major areas where things can um, become obstructed, where you can generate this, this, um, this iris trabecular touch. Uh, first of all, you can have um, a rotation or expansion of the ciliary body. So this is what happens in the context of choroidal effusions, so for example, that which happens uh, uh, as a result of some medications that are used or from tumors or cysts or from suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Uh, it could also happen with uh, choroidal attachment, although for other reasons, which we won't get into so much today, the pressure tends to stay low in that situation. It can happen in ciliary block, uh, also known as aqueous misdirection or melanin glaucoma. And one mechanism for this, for example, is when uh, there's a very large lens um, for example, the oversized IOLs that were placed in the eye historically, which can actually cause uh, cilio, IO, cilio lenticular touch and then cause more fluid to flow posteriorly as opposed to anteriorly. You can get pupillary block. Uh, this is what happens uh, not only in primary angle closure glaucoma, but in several other conditions, including uveitis, where you can get iris bombay, silicone oil, or a dislocated uh, IOL or an AC IOL. And finally, as we mentioned, you can actually have scarring of the angle shut, either in the setting of neovascular glaucoma, uh, uveitis, or chronic primary angle closure glaucoma. So just to review the mechanism again, uh, the angle can be pulled closed or pushed closed. And if it's pushed closed, it can either be by uh, fluid, um, either at the level of the pupil or the level of the ciliary body, or it can be as a result of the ciliary body itself. Um, so uh, it can be, for example, because of tumors or cysts, 
can be swelling of the ciliary body or it can be an anterior position of the ciliary body, which is what we see, for example, in plateau iris configuration, which probably accounts for a significant amount of angle closure. When you trace the, uh, the pathway of aqueous obstruction uh, of the ciliary body, um, you see that, uh, that it has to uh, first uh, pass through kind of a, a virtual channel from the um, I'm going to start this um, slide again, and uh, then hopefully you can edit it again afterwards. Uh, when you trace the path of aqueous fluid um, coming from the ciliary body, the first uh, the first potential area for obstruction is before it even gets uh, into. Sorry, we're going to try and start this one with this uh, slide one more time. So the first when you trace the pathway of aqueous humor from the ciliary body through to the trabecular meshwork, uh, the first place that it can get obstructed is um, right when it leaves the ciliary body. Uh, in other words, it can be uh, kind of redirected somewhat posteriorly, and this is one of the mechanisms that has been port put forth for this condition called, known as aqueous misdirection or melanin glaucoma. Uh, this condition has a lot of names, probably because its etiology is not very clearly delineated. So uh, the, most, the most common name or historical name has been malignant glaucoma. Uh, it's an old term and it was uh, introduced originally because these eyes were, um, were first treated with surgical iridotomy, but then afterwards surgical iridotomy did not cure the elevation of intraocular pressure. And so therefore it was called malignant, uh, meaning that it was hard to treat. It's also been known as ciliary block glaucoma. Uh, this is the idea that, uh, that for example, an elevate in a, uh, a large IOL or, or a native IOL may actually touch the ciliary body itself and instead of fluid flowing from the ciliary body into the posterior chamber of the eye, it actually flows back into the vitreous. And more recently, the term aqueous misdirection has, uh, has come about and it, uh, and it suggests that aqueous humor is being redirected through into the vitreous, which then pushes the lens forward and the angle closed and there probably is some truth to this. I'm going to go back and forth using the two terms for this because I know that there's a lot of controversy about the naming of this condition and I think that's not our purpose to necessarily understand the naming but rather to understand the condition itself. Um, the risk factors for this are, uh, for, are first and foremost angle closure glaucoma and you need to think about this, uh, this complication whenever you operate on a angle closure eye. This may be simply because the eye is very crowded so for example if you consider the ciliary block mechanism that we just discussed it may be that in a crowded eye, there's not as much space between the ciliary body processes and the lens itself, and so there's more potential for, uh, for those to touch or be in close contact, which would lead to a relative posterior flow of aqueous humor. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a complication which typically happens after surgery. There are a few reports of it happening after, after simply medication use, particularly pilocarpine, uh, but most often it happens after cataract extraction, trabeculectomy, tube shunts, or sometimes even laser procedures such as laser iridotomy. It doesn't happen right away. It's going to happen days or sometimes even weeks or months after the procedure. I think the classic finding is that what we call axial shallowing of the anterior chamber. So for example, you know, it may not simply be that the peripheral anterior chamber is shallow, but rather that the central anterior chamber is very shallow. It's as if the entire lens has been pushed forwards. The intraocular pressure is high, but it's not necessarily very high. I wrote here high teens and up, but that's the, even that is not completely true. Uh, if you have a, a um, intraocular pressure which is even 10 or 12, uh, malignant glaucoma needs to be in the differential. Of course, the angle will be closed, the central uh, anterior chamber will be shallow, and sometimes the pressure will be very high, in which case you might get nonspecific features which are associated with the elevated intraocular pressure, such as a cloudy cornea, pain, lower vision, halos, nausea, etc. This is a picture of uh, the central anterior chamber. So here you have a, a slit beam that shows even, um, you're not right in the center, but we're quite close to the, uh, the center or right at the edge of the pupil. And you can see the anterior chamber is very, very shallow, much beyond what you would ever see in, say, for example, uh, just a primary angle closure eye. Uh, so what are the mechanism that's uh, that's happening over here? Uh, 
Well, um, there's probably several, and our treatment has to relate to all of these as well. So the ciliary body is probably uh, swelling and so uh, and rotating anteriorly. So probably what we want to do is we want to rotate the ciliary body posteriorly, for example, with cycloplegics. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of vitreous pressure coming forward. It's probably the one thing that everybody agrees upon with regards to the mechanism of the disease is that when you get this um, flow of fluid through the vitreous, that this increased flow of fluid tends to cause the vitreous to be very, very compact and condensed. And once it becomes condensed like that, uh, it tends to become very impermeable to fluid. So whatever fluid that continues to go into the vitreous has a hard trouble getting out, and as a result, the entire vitreous is pushed forward. The analogy that I like to use for those of you who have done intraocular surgery is when you hydrate Tenon's capsule. So, for example, if you uh, are trying to do a subtenons block or you're infusing mitomycin as part of a trabeculectomy, if you inject balanceol solution or another solution into the tenons, it will rapidly hydrate, and then suddenly it will become much more um, impermeable to fluid. So its properties change. So I think the same thing is happening here, that when a lot of fluid flows through the vitreous, it becomes relatively impermeable uh, to fluid flowing through it. And then whatever fluid is there uh, has a hard time getting out and it just tends to push the whole vitreous face forwards rather than going anywhere. The result of that is the whole lens and, uh, and zonules and iris coming forwards. And then that takes the lens forward and it pushes the iris forwards as well so that the entire anterior chamber is collapsed. Um, you know, there's probably three parts of the disease, each of which we need to consider. First of all, the question is, well, why does it, why does it happen? Uh, nobody really knows for sure. There's been a lot of theories put forwards. You know, one idea is that the vitreous comes forward as a result, for example, of a sudden drop in the intraocular pressure. And now this, um, there is either touch of the lens and uh, the ciliary body, or now the anterior hyaloid touch of the ciliary body. So now there's a relative block of fluid coming forward into the posterior chamber, and rather there's a, a disproportionate amount of uh, aqueous humor which gets redirected into the vitreous cavity. Once that uh, it happens, you can say, well, why does it continue to happen? Uh, and this is a question which I think is quite mysterious. So certainly if a little extra fluid goes into the vitreous, normally aqueous humor is hydrating the vitreous. So why does it continue to hydrate it? And why does it become kind of overhydrated or kind of chronically overhydrated? Uh, well, it's not really clear. It may be that a temporary increase in uh, the rate of fluid that goes through there causes these vitreous changes that I was talking about earlier, such that the entire vitreous is condensed uh, or where they simply the, the vitreous just next to the anterior hyaloid is condensed. Um, it could be that uh, somewhat permanent ad adhesions occur either between the vitreous and the ciliary body or between the lens and the ciliary body. Or it could be that there's some sort of ball valve mechanism that's formed, which actually does misdirect aqueous in a more chronic fashion. This is a diagram which describes the, uh, the treatment options for this. It doesn't really list all of them, although I'll mention a couple that aren't even on this. Um, there's certainly a lot of laser uh, or surgical treatments that have been, uh, that have been discussed. Uh, people have discussed that if you can actually see the ciliary bodies, you can uh, treat them with an argon laser that shrinks them. And people have seen resolution of uh, malignant glaucoma from this alone. Um, if, it, uh, if it doesn't resolve, the other laser therapy you can uh, consider based on the patient's lens status, is that if they're pseudophake, you can consider a, um, a YAG anterior hyaloidotomy. So this is uh, like doing a YAG posterior capsulotomy, except you focus even more posteriorly, uh, and then you can um, try and focus on this thickened anterior hyaloid. And if you break a hole in that, um, you might actually resolve this whole episode. Um, if it doesn't work, or if the patient is phakic, uh, then usually you're going to be considering going straight to the emergency room, uh, assuming that medical treatment with cycloplegia and steroids hasn't worked. Uh, and then in the, in the surgery, we'll discuss what that surgery ought to be. But typically, you really want to make the eye unicameral, meaning that you want to make it one chamber. So you want to remove the vitreous. You want to remove a, uh, a bit of the iris. You want to move the zonules behind it. And you want to make sure that you disrupt the, the hyaloid. If you don't cut any of those, then it's possible that people will come back into malignant glaucoma again afterwards. And indeed, I've seen people who've had a vitrectomy, but the retinal surgeon was not fastidious about making a, um, a hyaloidectomy as well. And the patient comes back uh, with malignant glaucoma one or sometimes even two times.
of course, if somebody is fake ache during this, you're probably going to need to do a lens extraction as well. And you can either, either have the retinal surgeon do that, and you can put in a sulcus IOL, or you can do a combined procedure where you might do that yourself. Uh, the other treatment, which I must mention, does work fairly well, is diode laser. And there are some good studies which suggest that diode laser, which probably shrinks the ciliary processes, can be quite an effective therapy. Of note, there is one uh, recent paper from about a year and a half ago which describes um, the success of all treatments aside from diode laser uh, and found that uh, medical treatment, um, YAG hyaloidotomy, and, um, and cycloplegia, 